the Solana blockchain narrowly avoided yet another network outage this week as 40% of their nodes were taken offline with a simple flip of a switch from their cloud service provider. And although many people like to poke fun at Solana's frequent network outages, this issue, unfortunately, isn't limited to the Solana blockchain. Many of your favorite cryptocurrency blockchains that you think are decentralized are actually very highly consolidated at the node level, with many nodes being stored on cloud service providers, which are centralized entities. It's completely understandable from an economic perspective, but it's also a huge threat to decentralization. We're talking all about it in today's video. Hey everyone and welcome back. This is the Part-Time Economist and in today's video we are talking all about the consolidation and centralization of blockchain nodes onto centralized cloud hosting platforms. We'll explain what it means, why it makes sense, and what the implications are, but first I do want to give my standard disclaimer Nothing in this video is financial advice. I'm not advocating for or against any specific cryptocurrency projects. Rather, I'm trying to help you understand a little bit about some of the issues that are prevalent in the conversation about blockchain technology today. So with that being said, you probably saw it in the news. 40% of Solana nodes were taken offline with a simple flip of the switch. And like I said in the introduction, a lot of people like to poke fun at Solana because of their frequent network outages. However, this issue, I want to be very clear, is not unique to Solana. Even Ethereum, 70% of their nodes are hosted on centralized services. I don't remember the exact figure, but I think of that 70% of nodes that are hosted on centralized services, almost 50% of that is just AWS alone. So a huge centralization there in terms of where the nodes are being hosted. And I want to get into why that's important and why it matters. So the key idea of blockchain technology is that it is decentralized, right? No single actor can corrupt the network. So if I'm running a node and you're running a node and someone else wants to start spamming malicious transactions, well, the good players essentially outweigh the bad players because we're not um, collaborating, we're not working together, we are decentralized. So the more independent nodes, generally the more resilient the network is going to be. So the nodes, keep in mind, are the entities, the people that are validating these transactions. If we're talking about proof of work, they're the people you know, doing those complex mathematical puzzles. If it's proof of stake, they're not doing the math, but they're still validating transactions, storing that transaction history. So the nodes are the individuals kind of uh, running the blockchain, so to speak. So where do these centralized hosting services come into play? Well, in order to store all these transactions, you could imagine that that would probably be a pretty intensive task. Some blockchains have terabytes of data that need to be stored. And most users simply can't store that much on their average computer. So they have one of two options. Number one, they can invest in a dedicated computer, a server, something that's going to have the hardware capabilities to essentially fulfill this function, right? It's going to be expensive. It's going to need to have a lot of computing power. It's going to need to have a lot of storage space, bandwidth, all these different things. The second option is that they can simply pay a cloud hosting service to rent their servers, right? Rent server space, rent storage, all of these different things. Now, if you're looking at this from an individual node operator perspective, the idea of hosting your own node, investing into all this equipment has a couple disadvantages. Number one, it has a huge upfront cost. You've got to sink a lot of money into this node. Now, you might think this is a good investment, but what if the blockchain becomes unprofitable? What if it crashes, right? You might make this huge investment and it doesn't really pay off. 
The flip side is you might not have enough money to make this huge initial investment. The third option, you might have the money, but it's just too much work. It's not convenient for you. So what many people will do is they will essentially pay a cloud service provider such as AWS to host the node for them. This has a lot of advantages from an economic standpoint. Your initial investment is going to be lower than purchasing your own specialized server. You can pay payments on it, right? So kind of monthly. Again, I'm not an expert on AWS, but it's kind of an ongoing payment thing. So if crypto becomes unprofitable, you want to get out of running a node, you don't have to find someone to buy your huge server you simply say, hey, Amazon, I'm done with this. Don't bill me on the next cycle, right? So it's very interesting to me because we see this theory and idea of blockchains and what they represent and what they stand for, and that is decentralization. But we also see economics and profit motive coming into play here. If I, let's suppose that I do have the money to purchase a server. Now, I could probably do this, but even if I did have that upfront money, it's probably going to be cheaper for me to just host it on AWS or some other service provider. Why is that? because these service providers are huge. They have something that we call in economics uh, economies of scale, which means essentially they are huge, they can buy in bulk, um, they can do things cheaper than I can as an individual. So if I am running a node, I'm most likely doing that to turn a profit. So at the individual level, I'm going to survey my options and I'm going to say, okay, I could put a lot of money into this centralized server. It might break. The crypto might become unprofitable. I might decide I don't want to do it anymore. Um, it's going to be expensive. Or I could just pay Amazon however much a month to host my node for me. Okay, me as a profit maximizing node is going to go with AWS. And I keep saying AWS. I don't at all mean to recommend that as the only cloud hosting provider. It's just one that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to go with them. Now, each other node operator, again, if we assume that they are trying to maximize their profit, they're going to follow the same thought process. They're going to say, hey, it's cheaper. It's more efficient for me. I can maximize my profit by using a centralized hosting service. And not only are they going to go to a centralized hosting service, they're going to try to find the one that offers the best deal. Not all hosting services are going to have the same terms and conditions or fees or price structure. So we're all going to gravitate not just to cloud hosting in general, but towards a few providers that are able to do it the uh, cheapest for us. So it's very interesting to me because we have this idea of decentralization and the nodes themselves right? The nodes themselves might be decentralized, but if all the nodes are hosted on a single or even a narrow group of centralized servers, then yeah, the nodes can't corrupt the network, but the centralized providers can still shut down the network. So kind of an interesting thing to think about there. So where does this all lead us? What's the takeaway? What's the implication? Well, the first takeaway is that this is very common. This is very prevalent in cryptocurrency, and a lot of people don't look behind the scenes to see that this is actually the case. It also reminds me about Bitcoin. And again, I'm not recommending or endorsing Bitcoin, but it is kind of hearkening back to that block wars debate that took place several years ago. One of the arguments with Bitcoin uh, was that the small block size made it easier to be decentralized. And I'll give you an example of why that is. Every time that a cryptocurrency transaction is processed, it is put into something called a block. That's essentially a container of all the different transactions. Now, the smaller that block is, you can only fit in a few transactions. And one of the original complaints of Bitcoin was that it's slow, the fees are high, it takes too long. And again, we have a small block, we can only fit in a few transactions. So if you want your transaction to go through, you've either got to wait till there's an open spot, or you can pay a very high fee to get your transaction prioritized. A lot of people, they looked at this and they said, hey, who is going to spend and use this cryptocurrency on a day-to-day -day basis if they're paying these crazy high fees and if they're waiting forever for these transactions? Let's just make the container 
that block size, let's make it bigger. We can fit in more transactions, people won't have to wait as long, and it will be cheaper. And there were good arguments on both sides. Obviously, the idea of being able to spend crypto with low fees sounds good, but the people that wanted the small block size, they essentially put forth a couple arguments. One of these is that the bigger the block size gets, well, it becomes harder to process, validate transactions. You require more storage space on the blockchain. And you're thinking, what's the big deal about storage space? Exactly what we're seeing here with these nodes being hosted on centralized platforms. If my blockchain is, let's just make up a number, let's say five gigabytes, right? Something that anyone can host on their own personal computer, you're going to have uh, more than likely a very high degree of decentralization. No one is going to, if they've got a, you know, 500 gigabyte hard drive and many cases you're even looking at a terabyte hard drive to spend five gigabytes to host your own node is something most people can do they're not going to go through aws and everything like that for five gigabytes because they can easily do it on their own computer now if you start having a 10 20 30 terabyte or even in some cases a full terabyte most people can't do that on their computer while also running all their programs and applications so they're going to look towards AWS, something like that. So that was one of the key arguments for the smaller block size. We want the block size to be manageable enough that a full node can be run by an average user. Now keep in mind, that doesn't mean mining is going to be profitable for an average user, only that it's going to be possible for them to run a full node. So I found that very interesting that we kind of see a lot of that coming to fruition now with that original argument, Bitcoin needed to remain small block size so that average users could run nodes and other people saying, oh, it's okay, we'll increase the block size. It's almost uh, a degree of validation here in that we see with these cryptocurrencies that have really high speeds, um, there's something known as the blockchain trilemma, which essentially is a trade-off between, let me see if I can remember, scalability, security, and decentralization. A lot of the current chains, they looked at Bitcoin, they looked at Ethereum and said, people don't like them because they're slow, they have high transaction fees. We are going to prioritize speed at the expense of decentralization. And I just find it really fascinating that kind of these predictions that the original small blockers, as they call them, um, more or less we see those being reflected with these blockchains that prioritize speed really suffering on the decentralization front. And again, that's not to say that Solana or Ethereum is bad or that Bitcoin is good. It's simply that each cryptocurrency project has to make those trade-offs. With a lot of the current crypto projects, we see that they're not really as concerned about decentralization. They're more focused on speed and fees, whereas the original small block Bitcoiners, they wanted to prioritize decentralization. So, um, Again, not financial advice here. I just thought it was a really good example of how some of the current news within cryptocurrency really goes back to an age-old debate that's kind of been around since uh, the emergence of Bitcoin so long ago. So as always, thanks for watching the video. I hope you found it useful, and I'll see you next time. 